and welcome to GameSack. This episode is about Nintendo's best-selling console ever, the Wii. And actually, the Switch is probably going to surpass it in sales, so that comment's not going to age very well. But you may be asking yourself, what's going on here? Is the Wii retro now? I don't know. Does it even matter? Regardless, now is a great time to buy some Wii software. But first, let's check out the console itself. The Nintendo Wii was unleashed upon the world in 2006 just in time for Christmas. It sold extremely well and the console was very hard to find in stores for many months afterwards. The controller, called the Wii Remote, used motion controls. Also included was the Nunchuck, which included an analog thumbstick as well as its own accelerometer. Later on, they improved the technology with Wii Motion Plus, which added a gyroscope for more precision. A sensor bar is required and placed near the top or bottom of the TV so that the Wii Remote can see the two points of infrared light that it emits to help with the tracking. Wii games come on DVD discs, just as Nintendo's competitors did in the previous generation. The Wii is also backward compatible with GameCube discs and peripherals. Nintendo had no interest in competing graphically with Sony and Microsoft. The audio and video capabilities were very similar to the GameCube, despite actually having more powerful hardware. The Wii uses a PowerPC CPU that runs at 729 MHz compared to the GameCube's 486 MHz. The GPU is nearly identical as well, just 40% faster. The Wii also has a bit more memory. When it comes down to it, the Wii is basically a GameCube Pro. That didn't hurt its sales any, as it sold over 101 million units with 1,595 officially released games. While the console is based entirely around a motion control gimmick, you might be surprised to know that there are a lot of awesome games for the machine. Now, I'm not going to cover all 1,500 plus games in a single episode, but yeah, maybe more than 20 or so. Not all of them are winners, but all of them are somewhat interesting to me at least. Let's get going. Let's start off with Super Monkey Ball Banana Blitz. This was a launch game for the console. As a big fan of the first two games, I just had to pick it up. This one uses motion controls as the sole method of input here. It doesn't allow an option to use a nunchuck or the GameCube controller or any other form of analog stick. You roll forward by tilting the Wii remote forward and of course tilting it in any other way tilts the maze in that direction. Pretty simple. If you press A, you can jump and quite a few stages are built around this feature. New to the series are boss fights, which I always thought were a dumb idea. Does every game really need boss fights? Oh well, these ones aren't too bad actually. In fact, they're almost kind of fun. I enjoy the colorful graphics which are a big step up from the GameCube games in both style and detail. Some of the music is pretty good too. I've gotta be honest though, for the longest time I hated this game simply because of the motion control nonsense. I mean, I just wanted to play with an analog stick like the GameCube games. What was wrong with how they controlled? Then, Super Monkey Ball Banana Blitz HD came out for the modern systems in 2019. This one actually lets you use an analog stick. You know what though? It's actually much, much worse. I don't know if this is just a crappy remake or what, it really wouldn't surprise me, but the HD version really made me appreciate the original Wii game's controls when I came back to it here for this episode. For example, I could not beat this boss at all on the Xbox HD game. I tried so many times and no matter what, I could not do it. I mean, it's only the second boss. On the Wii, he's a cinch, and it somehow feels more precise and easier to control. The motion controls here certainly aren't perfect, but the game is definitely designed for them. I think I might have some newfound enjoyment for this game. Super Monkey Ball Step and Roll came out the next year. This one's main gimmick is that it works with the Wii balance board, which is why I skipped it. But you can actually play with the Wii remote as well. I never bothered with the balance board, so that's right, you're not going to be seeing a review of Wii Fit in this episode. Sorry. Anyway, this one controls pretty much like the previous game in regards to the Wii remote. However, gone is the jumping feature and gone are the boss fights. Also gone is good music. The game starts out pretty easy, but it does get challenging later. Still though, most of the stage designs aren't very interesting. Each world has its own specific object that's scattered around each stage, making sure that you take things slow since you have to carefully navigate around them. A few cues are taken from Super Monkey Ball 2, like the warps. 
Even the switches make a return. Oh, goody. Probably the worst thing about it is that you can't skip the credits the first time you beat each and every individual world. In fact, I just recommend sitting the controller down and walking away for a good six or seven minutes. Overall, I'd say that this one isn't awful, but Banana Blitz is better. In 2009 and 2010, Treasure brought a Sin and Punishment star successor. This is a follow-up to their Japanese-only Nintendo 64 game from 2000. And oh boy, is this a good one. An excellent one, in fact. There are many ways to control this one, including using a GameCube controller, but here I'm using a nunchuck and a Wii remote. Playing it this way, you point your reticle at the screen while using the nunchuck to move your character around. When things are close, you can tap the firing trigger, also known as the B button, to do a melee attack. This is actually key in this game because it not only causes a lot of damage, but you can send projectiles back at the enemy and completely ruin their week. You also have a dash evade, which reminds me of Treasure's own Alien Soldier on the Genesis. Well, actually, Mega Drive since that one never came out in North America. I mean, later it did, but not for the actual console. Anyway, if you dash at the right time, you can go right through an enemy attack unscathed. Since this is from Treasure, there are a ton of boss fights here. You'll get your ass handed to you from time to time for sure, especially on the stage boss fights. But learning their patterns is just super fun. The visuals are great for this system, and the music and sound are both pretty intense. I really can't recommend this one enough. Sometimes you just want to destroy lots and lots of alien stuff. This is one of the more memorable titles for the Wii, at least for me. Now this next game became stupidly expensive shortly after I bought it back in the day for some reason. It's not that way anymore, I'm guessing maybe that the publisher did another run. Regardless, it's, I still find this game very relaxing to play. This is Kororinpa, Kororinpa, I don't know, Marble Mania from Hudson and Konami. Your goal in this one is to tilt the Wii remote to move the marble around the stage, collect all of the orange crystals, and then move to the goal. It's similar to Super Monkey Ball and even Marble Madness, but different enough to stand on its own. The control is extremely responsive, so you're going to need a steady hand. The stage is able to rotate much more than Super Monkey Ball, so be careful. Probably the worst thing is that the stage doesn't rotate to your point of view, meaning that when the marble is rolling towards the screen, you can't see what's coming. This can sometimes result in some deaths. Fortunately, it's not a huge issue. This is one of the few games on the console that not only has no widescreen option, but no 480p option either. So 4x3 480i is all you get. Otherwise, this is a nice, relaxing game with lots of unlockables. The sequel called Marble Saga Kororimpa came out two years later. The premise of this one is exactly the same, just like you'd expect. They polished this one a bit more, adding a story involving an ant. He's also always on screen as you play. The game's textures have been updated and now it's finally in 480p and also in widescreen. Not everything's perfect though. In fact, the graphics kind of look almost overexposed. They also added an option to use the Wii balance board. Unfortunately, the control is far less sensitive than the first game. It takes a lot longer for your marble to begin moving and it seems to stop on a dime. It almost feels like the marble is coated with glue or maybe rubber cement. As a result, I find this one far less enjoyable to play than the first game. Neither game is crazy expensive like they used to be, but I suggest using your funds for the first one if either of these look good to you. Super 
Super Mario Galaxy was the premier Mario game on the Wii. This one let you run around so-called planets, which were smaller than most buildings. What Nintendo lacks in their knowledge of astronomy, they make up for in fun, and this game is nothing but. There's plenty of waggle that you'll be doing with the Wii Remote, but honestly, it doesn't feel that bad here. It actually becomes natural after a while. Most of the levels are straightforward, but there are some that encourage you to explore around a planet. The music isn't your normal Mario stuff, and it's all the better for it. It's definitely the best soundtrack in any Mario game that has ever been or ever will be. I highly recommend this game. Super Mario Galaxy 2 also showed up on the Wii. It's basically more of the same, except the levels are presented in more of a traditional method which is in line with the normal Mario games. And by that I mean the hub world. I prefer the first Mario Galaxy, but this one is still very, very good. Unlike the first one, I don't think I was motivated to complete this one. I don't think I ever beat it. Maybe I did. My save files are long gone, so I can't tell you. The music is still really good, though. <laughs> The final Mario game I'll mention is New Super Mario Bros. Wii. This is basically your regular run-of-the-mill Mario game, but it's pretty good. The music is back to being more aimed at kids, and the game is also in 2D. However, this one will let up to four people play at the same time, and I enjoyed this a ton back when it was released. I really like the fact that it's 2D, and it was great to see 2D games being widely accepted on modern consoles again. Playing it all these years later for this episode, though, I find myself not getting into it as much. I'm not sure why. Doesn't mean it's a bad game, though. Another great 2D game is Donkey Kong Country Returns. This one's not made by Rare like the ones on the Super Nintendo were, but instead Retro Studios, who's better known for Metroid Prime. Somebody's stolen all the bananas, and well, that's all the story you need. There's still plenty of bananas scattered throughout each level, though. The gameplay here is very similar to the Super Nintendo titles, although this one is a hair more 2.5D than, say, New Super Mario Bros. You can take more hits than the earlier games, though. Once you have Diddy, you can float during a jump, which is kind of nice. Sadly, there's a lot of waggle controls tossed in that feel extremely tacked on. For example, you need to shake the controller to pound the ground. You can hold down and shake the controller to blow dandelions. Why? This seems completely useless. Or hold left or right and shake to roll. How is this in any way more fun or immersive than normal controls? That's a good question, and the answer is, it isn't. This is also one of those Nintendo games that has a cheat function built right in. Lose a bunch of lives and the game offers to play the entire level for you. It doesn't simply show you what you need to do, it actually completes the level and unlocks the next one. I guess New Super Mario Bros. Wii had this as well from what I read. Overall, this one is nowhere near the jump from the 16-bit games as the 16-bit ones were over the 8-bit ones, but it's certainly still a lot of fun. Graphically, it's nothing special and honestly doesn't look much better than a GameCube game. Most of the music seems reminiscent or a direct rearrangement of the tunes in the originals, but it's good. Could be worse, but still, it could be better too. <laughs> Okay, I feel this next game kind of goes without saying, but it really is the identity of the console when it comes down to it. Yeah, you know what game I'm talking about, and don't you pretend you didn't enjoy it. I 
I should probably mention Wii Sports quickly since it was responsible for selling a ton of Wii consoles. This game uses motion controls to let you play simplified versions of tennis, baseball, bowling, golf, and boxing. Tennis feels pretty natural, and I even kind of like it. The baseball game is extremely simplified as you only control the pitching and the swinging of the bat. Golf is quite fun, and it works well. Boxing is the only game on here to use the nunchuck. I don't feel that this one is very responsive, but maybe I'm moving too fast for the simple motion control hardware from 2006. It really makes you want a proper punch-out game on the console. Bowling is the one that most people played the most, and it's probably the best game on here. It's easy to get the hang of. Families loved Wii Sports, and even Grandma could play. In fact, it wouldn't be unusual to see Wii consoles at family members' homes who weren't into games mainly because of this title. Nice spare! Wii Sports Resort came out three years later, and it requires a Wii Motion Plus capable controller. This one takes place on the same island as the Nintendo 64 and 3DS Pilot Wings games. It has a bunch more things you can do here as well. Like sword fighting, which is tough because you can only control your swings and not your movement, but it's still fun. There's also wakeboarding, which is okay, I guess. Looks great. Nice. Throwing a frisbee to your dog can be more fun than it looks like, and it requires the extra finesse that the Motion Plus offers. There's even bike racing here, where your arms basically control your legs. My favorite event by far is the archery. It uses the nunchuck and it almost feels like you have a weightless bow that you're operating. This is one of those events where you just want to keep trying again and again. All of the old games from the original title are here as well, so your family won't have to worry about switching discs. Actually, boxing is not here, but no one cares. This game is worth it for the archery segment alone, in my opinion. Five. Four. In 2009, we finally got a proper punch out game for the console. No Mike Tyson, no Super, this is the same name as the original after they got rid of Mike Tyson. I mean, they could have at least added another exclamation point or two. PUNCH OUT! Like Wii Boxing, you use a nunchuck so that you can pretend to actually box as you play the game. Honestly, this doesn't work very well at all, and I kind of hate it. You can also use a balance board if you want, which might actually help this mode. Thankfully, Nintendo allows an option to let you use the Wii Remote sideways like a controller. I'm totally surprised that Nintendo did this, as they seem to really double and triple down on the motion control gimmick for this console. Anyway, using these controls, the gameplay is just like the NES version, which makes it about a trillion times more comfortable and enjoyable to play. For some reason, Nintendo still requires you to point the Wii Remote at the screen to make selections instead of simply using the D-pad. I have no idea why they did that, but hey, it's Nintendo. Of course they didn't think to do that. Anyway, this game is incredibly fun, especially learning the patterns of each of your opponents. If you're good at the original, well, the same patterns pretty much apply here. Overall, it looks good and it sounds good, well, except for a few of the voices. I like these games, but I've never been hugely into the series. That said, it's still one of the best boxing games ever made by Country Mile because miles are longer in the country, I guess. I don't know. When Metroid Prime 1 and 2 came out on the GameCube, I wasn't interested as the move to first person wasn't appealing to me. But when Metroid Prime 3 Corruption came out on the Wii, I decided to pop on down to Circuit City and pick up a copy on release day. And I'm glad I did because I really enjoyed this one. 
The motion controls helped me get into the first person view a lot more, and I was enthralled throughout the entire experience despite the slow start. This is a very atmospheric game, and it's a great Metroidvania. <laughs> I know that term triggers some of you, which is why I enjoy saying it. The motion controls are fairly intuitive once you do each action once or twice. Even the nunchuck is used to grapple and pull things, and I always enjoyed doing this. The game also gives you a pretty good feeling of isolation a lot of the time. Beating this game made me more interested in the first two in the series, but it wasn't easy to get into with the GameCube controller. So when Nintendo double-dipped and brought out Metroid Prime Trilogy, it was a great opportunity for me to play the first two games with the Wii controls. As a plus, they were now in widescreen, which they weren't originally. I wholeheartedly recommend Metroid Prime 3 or Metroid Prime Trilogy. Here's Cruisin' from Midway, released in late 2007. This is loosely based on Midway's Cruisin' series of racing games. This is an original game for the Wii and not a port of an arcade game. Wait, 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 that's actually not true. There was an arcade game based on the Fast and the Furious movie franchise. They lost the license, so they changed the name to Cruisin'. Not Cruisin' USA or World or Universe or Galaxy or anything else, just Cruisin'. Anyway, this game is pretty arcadey. You can use the motion controls or the D-pad on the Wii remote. I prefer the D-pad, and it controls okay. It's certainly not bad enough to where you can't win. I like the destructible environments. Between rounds, you can choose how to upgrade your car, and it definitely helps. Overall, there are 12 different tracks to race on. The graphics are fairly simple, but they work. The music doesn't seem like it fits in a cruising game very much, but otherwise it's not obtrusive. Unfortunately, the sampled sounds like the voices and the car engine only come from the left speaker. Not much quality control going on over at Midway. Still, this is a simple and decently fun game that didn't sell tremendously well, and that's likely why not many people ever mention it. And look at you, now you know about it. It'll surprise nobody on the planet that Mario Kart got its very own entry as Mario Kart Wii. This game uses motion controls, of course, and it came with a silly plastic steering wheel for the kids that you can put the Wii remote into. Playing with the motion controls is tough, because unlike a real car, you have to hold the controller and or steering wheel up using your own power for the entire race. It's certainly not heavy, but it doesn't let you relax as you play, especially after several races. If you can find a place to rest your elbows, that'll help a bit. Fortunately, the game can also be played with the other options for the system, like the GameCube controller. This makes playing the game much more enjoyable. You have carts and bikes in this one. It has some cool new tracks, as well as some old tracks which are a prerequisite these days. I mean, it's obviously unreasonable to ask Nintendo to design too much new stuff. That would just be silly to expect that of them. Ah, uh, that's okay though, the old tracks are still pretty fun. I usually prefer my racing without the battling, and especially without the rubber banding, but if you enjoy relying more on luck than on skill, then this is good. It's fun to play and honestly hard to put down, just like most modern Mario Kart games. The graphics and music are typical for the series, nothing really much stands out here. The sound effects can be kind of annoying, but again, that's typical of the series. If you play with a Wii Remote, a lot of very loud and scratchy sounds will be emitted from its tinny speaker whenever there's something dangerous behind you. And that's all the more reason to play with a GameCube controller. This is the second best-selling game on the console, but all in all, it's nothing more than a typical entry into the series, which means it's pretty damn good. It just doesn't stand out. By now, some of you may be asking, where's Zelda? Where's Smash Brothers? The answer to that is, not in this episode. Everyone knows about those already. Plus, I've got to save a few heavy hitters if I ever do a follow-up to this episode. Instead, I'm going to waste your time talking about games that fewer of you have played, but should. Wow. 
I have to mention the Rebirth series of games from Konami. These were made by M2 and only available as WiiWare. First up is Castlevania The Adventure Rebirth. I talked about this somewhat recently in a dedicated Castlevania episode, so I'll make this one quick. It's great to see this series return to 2D on a mainstream console and not a handheld. Basically, this is a reimagining of the first Game Boy title, but with a hybrid of 16-bit and 32-bit style graphics with lots of scaling and rotating sprites as well as transparency effects. No 16-bit home console could do this game, I'll tell you that. Everything about this one is fantastic. Be sure to set your console to 4x3 for the Rebirth games or they're going to look a little bit blurry, unless you like that. I couldn't imagine not having this one in my collection, if you could call digital games a collection. Next is Contra Rebirth. This does the same thing, but for Contra. Sadly, it does seem a bit watered down compared to what they did for Castlevania, but it's still amazing while it lasts. There aren't a lot of weapons, in fact there are only four I believe, but that's okay. The action is extremely fast paced and the bosses are incredibly fun. Unfortunately, it's a bit too short. Yeah, I get that a lot. There are only five stages with two or three areas each. Maybe crank up the difficulty to make it last a little bit longer. You can unlock a tougher difficulty as well as more characters, so that's something to keep you playing. It's still absolutely worth owning. Here's Gradius Rebirth. Or Gradius, Gradius, who cares? Anyway, this is probably my least favorite game in the Rebirth series. It plays and even looks like a basic Gradius game. There are some very minor special effects like scaling and rotation here and there though. And the bosses can be pretty cool. Gameplay wise, it can't touch Gradius Gaiden or Gradius 5, which are the only two games in the series I feel truly got it right, especially part five. For some reason, there's even slowdown in this one. I have to imagine that they did this on purpose. If a game actually needs slowdown added, well, it's poorly designed. This one won't be blurry if you keep your Wii in 16x9 mode. However, it will stretch and distort the screen like your grandma does because she doesn't understand why there's black bars on the sides of the screen. Haha, <laughs> silly grandma. Make no mistake though, this is a standard 4x3 game. Overall, this is the weakest in the Rebirth series and it doesn't feel like a lot of effort went into it. The soundtrack isn't even as good as the other games in the series, not even close. Xenoblade Chronicles is a pretty cool action RPG from Monolith Soft. It's kinda sorta in the same universe as Xenogears and those games, but not directly related. The story is about a sword that uses a substance called Minato. No, not Minuto. Your entire world exists on a giant titan robot thingy that was doing battle with another one way back in the day. They both popped out of existence for no reason and fought for no reason on a world that only has sea and sky. Or maybe there is a reason. Hmm. It's not turn-based since this is an action RPG, but it's not straightforward like the East games are either. You first have to tell your party to engage in combat. You auto attack if you're within range. You can select from your arts down at the bottom of the screen, which are your stronger attacks and healing powers and the like. They all take time to recharge if you use them. It's definitely weird at first, but you'll get used to it quickly enough. When you're not in battle, you also auto heal in most areas. What's nice is that you see a graphical representation of how much more experience each character needs to get to the next level as you fight, so that can help encourage grinding. And you'll need to do some of that in this game for sure. The town areas offer the things that you'd expect like shops as well as side quests from certain NPCs. The graphics are quite good for the console. This looks even better than a PlayStation 2 game! I kid, I kid, but it does look nice. Even better is the music, but that's always been the case with the Xeno games. It really complements the adventure. If you like action RPGs, then you cannot go wrong with any of the several ports of this game. The Wii 
Bungie even got a remake of the original Klonoa game simply titled Klonoa. This comes 11 years after the first game was released on the PlayStation, and it features a fairly significant overhaul on the graphics. Wow, that's looking nice. The game still plays the same, mostly. It's a bit easier now as you have a larger health meter. Some of the stages have also been slightly redesigned. Anyway, you're a dude with big ears, at least I think they're ears, and you have a little orb friend that travels around with you. You grab enemies with the action button, and you can carry them around. They can be tossed to destroy other enemies, some obstacles, and eggs which can contain useful items like a key. You can also use them to double jump. If you're not carrying an enemy, Klonoa can only float down after a jump. The game is 2.5D and the stages twist and turn around like crazy. There are a bunch of doorways to go in and out of, and each stage, or vision as the game calls them, is pretty long. The good news is, is that they're not too long. They know right when to stop so it never feels like it's dragging on and on. This game felt pretty fresh back in the day, and it's still super fun, even now. The music seems to have been brought straight over, and that's fine because it was pretty good already, and the Wii itself can't do any better. That's not a knock at the console, it's just true. However, now you get English voices instead of the gibberish that the original game had. We finally made it to the top of Bell Hill! Overall, I really like this version, and I feel that you should play it. Unless you don't wanna. I want to take some time to mention the Wii Virtual Console. Now, what is the Virtual Console? Basically, this is how Nintendo offered games from consoles prior to the GameCube to be played on the Wii. You'd sign into the Wii Shop channel and then spend points instead of money to download games, though you'd have to purchase the points. You know, I never really understood this. Just tell me the price. I don't care about points or any other middleman currency. Anyway, you could buy games for the NES, Super NES, Nintendo 64, Genesis, TurboGrafx-16, Arcade, Master System, Genesis, I already said Genesis, and more. The Wii Shop channel was discontinued on the original Wii, but many of these same titles can still be obtained in the eShop on later consoles. What's great about most of these titles is that if you hook your Wii up to a CRT television, you can play them in 240p, and that makes them look a lot closer to the real thing, despite being emulation. The arcade games are awesome. I really love playing Sega arcade games like Super Hang-On, Golden Axe, Altered Beast, and hell, even the weird Wonder Boy and Monster Land arcade. They look fantastic in 240p via component video and even work with a GameCube controller. However, not all of the virtual consoles were treated equally. NES games, for example, are much darker than they should be. There's really no reason for this, but apparently it didn't bother Nintendo enough to ever fix it. I'm sure at least some people let them know about it though, at least I hope so. Maybe they did it for epilepsy purposes, but the NES Classic doesn't have this issue, so who knows? Fortunately, the Super Nintendo emulation looks pretty good. The Nintendo 64 also looks a bit dark, but not as bad as the NES. Some arcade games, like those from Namco, don't support 240p. Mappy here only runs in 480i no matter what, in addition to looking a bit dim. You go, Namco. The Master System looks slightly dark, as does the Genesis. It's really not too bad, though. The Neo Geo, on the other hand, looks pretty darn good. The TurboGrafx-16 Virtual Console is where things kind of fall apart. Not only is it dark, but they have a blur filter slapped on top of it for quite literally no reason. They don't allow you to disable it, and it looks much worse than a real TurboGrafx-16 on a CRT, as you can imagine. The last few releases for the TurboGrafx-16 Virtual Console, like East Book 1 and 2, Gradius 2, and Castlevania Rondo of Blood, fixed this issue. I'm glad that someone listened. For me, though, it's all about the arcades. It's great to be able to play them at all, but on a CRT and 240p? Sign me up! This is also a good reason to check out The Mister, by the way, but that's another episode. Oh, and by the way, the Wii U can't display any of these games in 240p if you have them loaded onto the Wii side of that console. That's all the more reason to keep your original Wii around. Kirby even had a couple of games on the Wii, starting with Kirby's Epic Yarn. 
This is not your typical Kirby game. You've been turned into yarn and taken into a new world or dimension or something. Of course, you need to save the land from slightly evil enemies as usual. However, you can't suck up your enemies and take on their characteristics like you'd expect. Instead, you swing a yarn lasso as your attack. You can grab enemies and unfurl them out of existence, many of whom are simply minding their own business and doing nothing wrong. That's right, I think you're probably the bad guy here. You can also transform into different things, like a car when you double tap a direction to run, or a little submarine when you're swimming underwater, or perhaps an umbrella if you hold the jump button to float down. Many of the stages have you transform into a specific thing to get through a big part of it and it only adds to the fun that you are already having. Each of these things has its own method of control, some of them relying on motion controls. After you complete a stage, you get a thing that you use in the hub world which opens up the next stage. I like how they find ways to make the next stage accessible. The graphics are phenomenal, with tons of color and style. I love the texture and the design of everything too. It all moves so fluidly and with great physics. I also love how the world squishes down a little bit wherever Kirby steps. I do wonder how it would look with a bit of parallax scrolling though. The music is not your typical video game stuff, with most of it being light and breezy, but it absolutely fits. This one's designed more for the younger crowd, so it's definitely a bit easy, but it's still worth playing no matter how wrinkled your dusty old ass is. Finally, Kirby's Return to Dreamland came out about a year later. This is definitely a more traditional Kirby game. It's a lot more action-packed and fast-paced, in line with the Super Nintendo Dreamland game. You can swallow enemies and press down to absorb their power just like most of the other entries in the series. Some of these powers are familiar and some of them are new. There are also some really cool superpowers which are extra fun to use, but it doesn't happen often. That's okay though. If you like Kirby, this probably won't let you down as it's pretty much more of the same with some upgraded visuals. You have plenty of parallax scrolling now and of course you're still treated to a very colorful world. The music is far more lively here than it was in Epic Yarn. Many of the sound effects seem like they were taken straight out of the Super Nintendo game. Overall, this is a great adventure, but I think I might prefer Epic Yarn a bit more for its creativity, at least as far as the Wii games go. That said, definitely don't pass this one up. And there you go, that's a Nintendo Wii for you. I've gotta be honest, I do not miss motion controls or waggle at all. Not. One. Bit. I'm glad we were all able to make it through that gaming phase together and survive. It was kind of interesting though when it was new, at least for a short while. Anyway, what do you think of the Nintendo Wii? Love it? Hate it? Let me know. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameStack. Are you sick of using a normal controller to play video games? Damn right I am! Who wants to relax and press buttons while playing a video game? So stupid! <laughs> then you need to check out the Nintendo Wii! Hell yeah, this is way better! The Nintendo Wii is the future of gaming! Absolutely! This nonsense will never get old! Nintendo could package feces in a box and you'd buy it! Oh hell yeah I would! As long as there's a gimmick, I am sold! Waggle your way into the future with the Nintendo Wii!